everybody's found their way back. And we pray, Lord, open thou my heart to hear, and through your word to me draw near. Let me your word ever pure retain. Let me thy child and heir remain. Amen. James and John, in our text, call shotgun. To be able to see and hear, first in the kingdom of God, and probably in order to be able to be seen and heard and recognized in the kingdom of God. This selfish request is especially embarrassing because it comes right after Jesus' third prediction of his death in Jerusalem, where he clearly tells his disciples he's going to Jerusalem where he will be mocked, he will be spit upon, he will be betrayed, he will be killed, and on the third day he will rise. So after he shares that with his disciples, that's when James and John come up and say, hey, we have a request. Do whatever we want. Uh, And Jesus, of course, wisely, wisely asks them, what do you want? A less selfish and less embarrassing response might have been, oh, oh, Jesus, poor Jesus, what can we do for you? But this is the third time that they have heard that. That was tried before when Peter took Jesus aside after his first prophecy or prediction. He says, this will never happen to you. And then Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Well, that's part of our problem. Do you really believe the Bible when it tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick? Another translation says beyond cure. Who can understand it? Do you really believe the catechism that teaches that we are by nature spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God? The ten other disciples were angry at James and John for asking for such a favor from Jesus. But let's not kid ourselves. We're in there right with them, along with James and John. We, too, are deeply affected by sin, selfishness, me first itis. Just ask a spouse, a child, a parent, or a friend about how you are affected by me first itis, or selfishness, or sin. And they might give you a better idea of its seriousness in your everyday life and some of its symptoms. The best diagnosis, of course, of our sinful condition is from the Word of God. The Word of God tells us, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The other quote was from Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Our confessions put it this way. It's like an a x-ray, an x-ray from the Word of God. We believe, teach, and confess that original sin is not a slight corruption of human nature, but that it is so deep a corruption that nothing sound or uncorrupted has survived in man's body or soul, in his inward or outward power. This damage is so unspeakable that it may not be recognized by a rational process, but only from God's Word. That's a desperate situation. And the prognosis for that diagnosis There is no cure. There is no cure this side of heaven. It's something that we will simply have to live with until we die. And left to ourselves, we would grow more selfish and more sinful day by day. Our confessions also say evil left unchecked grows worse. So what's the prescription for this disease of sin, this disease of me first itis, as demonstrated in our gospel today by James and John especially, and the disciples, other disciples as well. Well, it's not just try harder. Uh, We can take care of this. Now, if I'm sincere, if I really try hard, I can take care of this myself. It doesn't work that way. This problem is too big for you and me to handle. That's why Jesus went to the cross He had to take care of our problem of sin in a final and a permanent way. 
and the prescription now, since the war has been won, the skirmishes that we are involved in, God will help us. He will come to us with his word and his sacraments to give us his strength to fight the good fight of the faith. He will give us his promises of forgiveness to strengthen us, to assure us that we have truly been forgiven. That's why we're here, to listen to his word, to remember our baptism. When we celebrate communion, to receive his very body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. To hear a person say, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those are all ways God has of coming to us to assure us of forgiveness, to forgive us our sins. And as we live in our baptism, we remember what God has done for us. The Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism once begun and ever continued. And once again, what we read or what we said in the object lesson, baptizing with water indicates that the old Adam in us, our old sinful nature, should by daily contrition, that's sorrow, sorrow over sin, and repentance, that's faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. That gives us strength. God gives us strength to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow, to serve one another, to serve one another in love. God does not need our good works. Your neighbor does. Your mom and dad need your good works at home to help around the house, to pick things up, to listen to mom and dad when they talk to you. That's your service. That's your vocation as a child. We understand, when we understand the seriousness of our condition of sin, the prescription of just try harder or be more sincere, when we take that as a cure, that's almost laughable. It's not about being first. It's, not, it, it's about knowing our great, great need of forgiveness and receiving God's gifts of forgiveness in baptism and forgiveness in, with, and under the bread and wine and his body and blood in the supper. It's simply believing his word that you are forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Would those who are able please rise for the Te Deum Canticle on page 223.